The final of the FIDE Online Olympiad finished in controversy after a global internet outage stopped play in the final between India and Russia. First match was drawn 3-3, but in the second, two games were left unfinished after this disconnection problem and India were declared the losers in both those games. They appealed and then the FIDE president, Arkady Dvorkovic, stepped in and declared that both teams should be awarded gold medals. Now, there was delight in India uh, after, well, they had had a superb run of form in the, in the whole tournament. And the Indian team was publicly congratulated by the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi. The Russian team were perhaps less pleased. There were a couple of salty tweets from Alexandra Kostanyuk and Jan Nishi. Uh, there was also um, dissatisfaction expressed uh, by the Armenian team who had had a disconnection problem in the quarterfinal against India, but their appeal had been rejected and they subsequently withdrew. So, not really very satisfactory all around. Um, so, was Dvor Arkady Dvorkovic's decision fair? Well, I think we need to take a look at the games in the final to try and come to a, a decision on that. Um, when the outage took place, when the disconnection took place, three games had already been drawn in in the in the final and three games were still in progress um as i understand it alexandra goryachkina's game against humpy koneru uh, continued after a pause and goryachkina actually won that game so and the other two games were then forfeited by india so let's take a look at those final positions so this is the final position between Andrei Asipenko and Nihal Sarin. Um, so Asipenko has just played the rook from e6 to e5. Now Sarin had been under a lot of pressure in this game, but he, by, the, by this stage, actually, I think he's absolutely fine. He needs just to find this move, knight b4. You can see that that knight is on prize, also that pawn as well. But knight b4, I think, is a fairly obvious move, actually. I know this is rapid play, but I think it's, it's a pretty natural-looking move. Opening up the d-file, as well as this long diagonal as well. So rook takes rook, rook takes rook. And now bishop takes c6. I think those moves are pretty obvious, almost forced. And here, well, if knight takes bishop, then rook takes pawn check, does give white a few winning chances. But black just needs to find this Zwischenzug, king f6. That's a nice move. Attacking the rook, which has to drop back. Then after knight takes, well, I think this position should end in a draw because black's rook stands very well it's about to come down here you know knight c5 and then um, well, either rook d2 or well rook d1 check and rook d2 and rook takes and this knight is about to whoops head into here and potentially here it it's equal basically so i think that game should end in a draw after knight b4. So what about the other game? Well, that's less clear. So this is a game between Divya Deshmukh from India and Polina Shuvalova from Russia. Apologies for my pronunciation. In all cases, I've probably got it wrong. So you can see this is the position after 25 moves. Desh Deshmukh is white... Shuvalova is black. No pieces have been exchanged from the board. So 
that makes for a really complex situation. If you put a computer engine on this position, it thinks that white is doing extremely well. Now, I think it's less clear, to be honest, because I think in rapid play, well, with all the pieces on the board, it's still not entirely clear. Yes, I would take white's position every time. <laughs> but let me just show you a few things. Well, you can see that black has no decent counterplay here. The queen side is pretty much locked. The center is locked here, and white is playing on the king side. Um, Deshmukh has brought this bishop over to c2, an excellent position. Well, you can see that white's pieces are pointing at the king's side. This rook has come to h1. It's a beautiful attacking position for white. But how do you actually make the breakthrough? Clearly, white has to get rid of this knight. So this knight may drop back to e3. And another way to do this is to play h5 and then maybe knight h4 or knight e3. Maybe even dropping this back to h2 and g4. But h5 looks plausible um, in this position because that means it's less likely that black can actually play the pawn to g6. That'll be taken. And then obviously h6 would cave in. So the next move for white may be knight h4 or knight e3 just to get rid of that knight and to continue on the king side. But I wonder if the Russian had considered this move, knight c5. Now, this is one of those crazy moves you can imagine seeing on the board in a rapid play game and just, whoa, what happens now? Um, if that's taken, then actually, incredibly, the position opens in black's favour. You can see that long diagonal opens and potentially the d-file as well. If pawn takes pawn, then knight takes. And actually, because of this pin and the pressure here, black is actually winning that position. So after knight c5, well, white has to think again. You can imagine what a shock that would be in a game. So let's just nudge the queen to the side. I, mean, I wouldn't say it's a particularly obvious move, but it protects the knight and preempts the knight coming in. But okay, the knight comes into e4. Now this is already less clear. So what do you do about that? You don't particularly want to take at the moment. White could continue with knight h4, get rid of this knight and perhaps play f3. Now, Black could wait around, but this is a very interesting move. b4, with the idea of pawn takes pawn, and then a3 to undermine the pawn on c3. Really interesting. Now, white could take here, and maybe take here, but you can see that that's not a winning attack, which many... Um, commentators uh, would have you believe in this position. I mean, white still has a lot of hard work to do here, actually. Um, and, you know, the queen side can open a little bit. If white gets it wrong, then that light squared bishop could fly through. Yes, I think white should be winning this position, but there's still some work to do. So, those are the two games in question. And of course, there are many, many other possibilities here. Apart from h5, there's also knight e3 immediately is a possibility. But you always have to think about this idea, knight c5. So, yes, it's looking good for white, but still a long way to go. So, if those two games had ended in a draw and a win for uh, Deshmuk, then it the match could have ended 3-3, but we will never know. Um, but let's just think about this decision. Can you imagine the outcry if Russia had simply been awarded victory on the basis of a disconnection? That would have been completely unsatisfactory, in my opinion. And how would Dvorkovich have looked, a Russian, of course, have looked in those circumstances? Not great. Um, in fact, you might say that his 
decision to award gold medals uh, and not to give Russia outside, out, outright victory was actually quite a brave decision. I mean, he's Dvorkovich is receiving a lot of criticism from many Russians. So I think that that's an interesting one. Could they have risked a playoff? That might have been a way to find a clear winner. They could have had an Armageddon playoff. That might have been a way around it. But the tournament, the, the final had already dragged on a long time. And who knows, they could have had another uh, disconnection problem. So basically, the situation was a mess. It was a difficult situation and completely unsatisfactory. You know, you can't decide things on uh, uh, on disconnection. A complete mess. So I think Dvorkovich's decision was really pragmatic, actually. And in a, in a way, a very positive decision <laughs> to award both teams gold medals. But all I can say is the sooner that we get back to over-the-board playing and not playing online, where we're prey to these kind of disconnection problems, the better. I look forward to a proper Olympiad with classical time controls played over the board. Congratulations to both India and Russia.